hello from my home in Oxford. Um, I'm Susan Miriam Vosita, Junior Research Fellow in History at Pembroke College. In 1915, Britain was determined to expose the Armenian Genocide. In fact, no nation in 1915 was more determined to expose and punish what it termed a crime against humanity. And yet, when it comes to the recognition of the Armenian Genocide today, avoidance remains the official policy. The history of the Armenian Genocide is a history that breaks your heart. It must break your heart. It is the history of a crime that goes unpunished, the history of a tragedy that goes unacknowledged, the history of a war that never ended, the history of a region that never saw peace. It is also the history of the 20th and 21st century. Aleppo, the hometown of my grandmother Miriam, has seen more war refugees coming and going than any other city in the past 100 years or so. From 100 years ago until now, though nothing has changed. Even the images we see remain the same. The only difference is that now we see them in color and on our social media feeds. In her poem, Summer Day, Mary Oliver asks, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? It's a beautiful question, I absolutely love it. But it's also a question that many amongst us do not and did not have the privilege of asking themselves. Because they lived and lived in precarity, war and instability. Tell me, how can you ask yourself this question when you stand in line at the food bank or sleep rough on the streets of Oxford? a reality that more and more of us have to face. Tell me, how can you ask yourself this question when you do not have enough food to feed your child and live in tattered tents somewhere no one wants to go? Tell me, how can you ask yourself this question when you're sitting in a boat on the coast of Greece, not being allowed entry into the European Union but beaten with sticks? Tell me, can you ask yourself this question when you're incarcerated for your political views, in custody for your academic work, killed and raped for your identity? Please tell me. Black and white, or colored and on our social media feeds, the images of our past and present are the same. In them, never again is mocked on a daily basis. Your colleagues, students, friends, fellow Pembrokeans, fellow human beings. We have to open the borders of our hearts, minds, houses, colleges, universities and countries to prevent history from repeating itself. There is simply no other way. On March 9th, Professor Theo von Lind, also from Pembroke College, and I launched the Oxford Network for Armenian Genocide Research at Pembroke College, something that I'm incredibly proud of. I thought about telling you about what we had achieved in such a short time period, to tell you about what we have planned and what we would like to achieve in the future. I wanted to really tell you that we are the first such network I mean, in the UK. Unbelievable, but yes. Um, but then I thought you probably already know all of this um, from the newspapers, or that you will learn about it sooner or later if you do a good job. So I want to tell you about a remarkable woman instead. Her name is Edith Roberts. Edith Roberts came to Aleppo in the 1920s to work for the Commission for the Protection of Women and Children in the Near East. 
The commission was formed by the League of Nations to recover those survivors of the Armenian genocide who had been kidnapped into sexual slavery. The Armenian genocide was a gendered genocide. Women were allowed to live. There was no concept of race prohibiting the assimilation of Armenian women or indeed children into Muslim households. In the 1920s, a reported number of 20 to 30,000 Armenian women and children were still living in Muslim captivity in Turkey and French mandate Syria. The commission rescued thousands of women and children and interviewed some of them about their experiences. From these interviews, we learned that by the time these women and children were rescued, they had been living in Muslim captivity for so long, often more than 10 years that the children had forgotten how to speak Armenian and the woman had borne one or two, sometimes three children to their perpetrators and rapists. In 1927, the League of Nations withdrew all of its funding from the commission. There were now more pressing issues on the world's agenda. The work of the commission continued for a few more years with money from the individual states, philanthropic organizations, but officially stopped its operations when Great Britain, as the last state, withdrew its funding. Edith Roberts, who had worked for the Commission all these years, decided to stay on. Supported by British Quakers and her own money, she continued the work of the Commission on a much smaller but extremely important way. Her letters from Aleppo in the 1930s are truly heartbreaking. They speak of her struggles and sorrows of helping those who had already forgot, or who had, those the world had already been forgetting. In her letter of 1932, she writes, quote, The strong lower part of this building is now acting as a mad asylum. We have five insane cases, three of these women whom we feared were endangering the lives of their children if not isolated. We have an experienced mental hospital worker who is helped by the semi-blind Aram and the crippled Levon. It is wonderful to see how Levon transverses our cold stone floor on his haunches, he has no legs, to perform skilled service as a nurse to a mere helpless case than himself." End of Edith Roberts, as I said, was a remarkable woman. She has taught me a lot. She has taught me that we should not think in terms of victims and survivors of the Armenian genocide, or any genocide, really. The victimization estimate should account for those who were killed and those who weren't killed. She has taught me that, yes, genocide killed millions of people, but tortured, raped, maimed, impaired even more. Something that Article 2 of the 1948 Genocide Convention actually reminds us of. She has also taught me to think of the Levons and the Arams and the unnamed survivors of the Armenian Genocide, like those three women in her letter whom she had found in a local hospital in Aleppo, handcuffed to their beds and driven into insanity by what they had lived through. I would like to end with a few moments of silence and please join me. During these moments of silence, I ask us to think of Levon and Aram and these three women in Aleppo who have survived the Armenian genocide of 1915, now more than 105 years ago, but never lived in our world again. They have witnessed a world that most of us have not begun to face and never wished to. We should remind ourselves that they have paid for our freedom. We owe it to them to never look away. So please let us not be afraid and always be on the side of freedom, which is, let me tell you, just another word for peace. Thank you.
Thank you. I hope you stay safe. Um, if you would like to know more about Armenian genocide or about my work, um, you can always email me. Um, uh, we can arrange a Skype um, meeting and um, my new book will come out in November and um, I'm sure we will do a reading at Pembroke. Um, so stay safe, stay inside, um, but still cherish your freedom. Ciao.